This is Robert Yeoman, and you're listening to the Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ilya. Hey there, Ben Rock. How you doing? I'm doing swell. How are you doing? I am also swell. Uh, we've got a great show today. We've got Bob Yeoman returning uh, oh my to God. talk to us again for another uh, hour or so. It was it was great talking to him again. Coolest I'm so glad guy. To- Can I just say the coolest guy? So cool to talk to him. I love hearing him talk about stuff. And uh, I have to apologize because I didn't properly introduce him like I usually do when we're interviewing people. We just started talking. We just kind of picked up where we left off last time. He's uh, so freaking cool. And uh, he, he's done a whole slate of new Wes Anderson movies. Uh, Asteroid yeah. City. Asteroid and City, which which is on currently on Peacock streaming. And then mm-hmm. there's like a series of Roald Dahl uh, shorts, uh, three that he shot that are uh, currently on Netflix. But, but watch the fourth one, too. You know, be a completionist. Why watch them all? It's on Netflix. You can yeah. see all of them. Roman Coppola shot the uh, the fourth one, which is called The Swan, which spoiler. I totally thought when I was watching it, I was watching Bob Yeoman. I, I, I totally felt like, you know, Roman Coppola must have channeled Bob Yeoman. It was, you know, it felt, ve- it felt <laughs> well, like, very much in the in the same thing. I same don't want to spoil it for anybody, but I will I will say. Uh, lots of surprises in this interview. There were many times where you and I were like, what? Yes, a few what's. I mean, really like big, big what's. And like, if you haven't seen Asteroid City, and uh, let me tell you, the reviews from some some of the people I know who did see it, it was polarizing. Some people were, were really into it. Some people were not so into it. Some people were, were in the middle. But I will tell you that. What, Wes Anderson after- is, is, a, is a polarizing uh, filmmaker in that people who love him really love him. And some people are not into that style. I'm a huge fan of Wes Anderson, so I was excited to see it. And you know what? I will say that some Wes Anderson movies are like on my favorite list of all time movies. And others are kind of like, hmm. You know, it's fine. I enjoyed it, but it was it wasn't like, you know, didn't make my favorite list of all time. But, you know, it's a very, very short list of people on my favorite list of all time. It's like Stanley Kubrick, yeah. Wes Anderson. <laughs> There's not too many people there. It's now it's, it's no, no. It's, his, it's his work praise. is amazing. And so, Asteroids, Asteroid City is some pretty amazing work. And uh, really just it's such a beautiful looking film. And I feel like this is telling and I even talked uh, mentioned this to Bob is that there's like all these YouTube channels that are about how to make your movie look like a real movie, whatever, how to co- how to color grade. Science. Exciting Asteroid City. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I remember seeing like how to get the Asteroid City look. Even just as reference, it's good, but it's got an all-star cast. Uh, I, I can't oh recommend it hi- highly enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, it, there's some there's some really fun stuff in that movie for sure. And now, close focus. So, uh, Ilya, what is our short end? Excuse me, Ilya, what is our <laughs> close focus? It. Last week I did that. Last week yeah. I I, sw- I flip flopped the two, but this week yeah. yes, our. our close focus for this week is we have to talk about the strike is over. The SAG strike is over. The writer's strike is over. For a brief moment in time right now, there are no strikes going on in the industry. And that is that is wonderful. It has been a hard, I mean, hard six months for a lot of companies out there. And And for and for a lot of people, myself included. But like so many people I know are just out of work. I, I Etsy crew people have been out of work for six months. We we talked about this. I'm not going to say ad nauseum, but we've talked about it a lot on the show because it was it was the number one order of business for the industry, including like my company, including uh, crew people, production companies, all kinds of people who I have two projects that are hung up that cannot move forward until the Screen Actors Guild strike was ended or if either one of them had gotten an interim agreement, which neither one of them did. Well, uh, the full vote to the membership is happening now. It was approved 86% in favor by the executive board. I do not see the SAG membership rejecting this deal. Yeah, I, I, I heard it referred to as a formality going to the membership, and I'm like, I don't know, but uh, we'll you know, see. I actually strongly predicted incorrectly, actually last time we had Bob Yeoman on, what we were talking about the, uh, you know, the IOTC strike. And yeah. in the IOTC strike, I was like, I was reading a lot of vitriol about people really unhappy with the deal really unhappy that working conditions weren't addressed i'm and still shocked i actually didn't strike to this yeah. day 
Well, uh, they had it. They had it right there. They could have done it. They're going to have another opportunity coming up, and I think there's a lot of people with bated breath right now too, thinking like, you know, like oh, look, I'm not going to say that IOTC just always rolls over, but they totally rolled over in the last one, and and uh, I think it's really interesting because the number one gripe from SAG, the number one, uh, you know, the number one gripe from the people who dissented, that 14% that dissented against the deal, was about AI and was about AI coming to take actors' jobs, you know. Uh, I, I don't mean to be a spoiler here, but newsflash, if it takes actors' jobs, it's going to take camera people's jobs. It's, it's going to take, take everybody's e- jobs. Yeah, it's going to yeah, take like, everybody's jobs. I've, I've is- talked about this a lot as a DGA member. Like DGA uh, got into the nut meat of AI, but not to the degree that WGA and SAG did. And I think it's because you can't really replace set operations with AI yet what you could one day theoretically like very theoretically replace you could replace the entire shoot with AI and at that point you you don't need a director or you don't need set operations but I am firmly of the belief that that's like very science fiction and it's not if it it's, happens at all it's not happening anytime soon I don't think it's happening in the next three years, which is when there's going to be another chance to, to negotiate again. For but let me let me ask you though, yeah. going back to the, to the IATSE thing mm. after after six months of two unions striking, and I don't know when IATSE's next uh, negotiation comes up, but let's say it's within the next year, 20, year and a half. Yeah, it's 2024. Yeah, so like, is the do you think there's appetite to strike that, right now? That's, I'd say that's my very question. Low. Like, is, very the, indus- is the industry yeah. so freaking broken right now, and people so desperate to get back to work that if IATSE went on, I would say a an extremely justified strike, would that not just be considered the biggest middle finger to the entire industry? I don't know. I mean, like, obviously, you know, a couple of years ago when they were possibly going to go on a strike, they would have been ahead of all this. Now it's like we had COVID, then we had six months of complete work stoppage because of two different strikes and i just feel like you know even if iatsi or teamsters have legitimate complaints and they do how can they how can they no make no they're, what they're they going to be accused manifest? yeah i agree accused of being tone deaf accused of not being able to read the room accused of like not uh but but here's the thing that you know iatsi has to look out for their own iatsi has to do what's in the best interest of their members and they might may be feeling the same sort of existential threat that the writers and the actors just went through. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I will tell I mean, you that their, I, their ex- existential threat is called Fratter Day. I mean, like what? what <laughs> yes, the, yeah, the, there's, their, there's, their threat there. is basically is more. And it's uh, funny because I talked about Fratter Day last time Bob Yeoman was on. We talked about <laughs> this in the in in the, you know, this exact sort of banter for yeah. close focus. We talked about this exact sort of stuff. So clearly still issues, issues like, unresolved. I don't think that you're yeah. going to be replacing a key grip with AI anytime soon. I think that the, the thing is that you're just going to be uh, replacing uh, you're, you're treating them like they're just disposable people and just slotting in younger, newer people all the time because you're wearing people out. But I, I, if people want to look at the writing on the wall for AI, because right now AI is a very, very good parlor trick. It's a good parlor trick that gets people amazed and talking to computer scientists, talking to the people who are involved in machine learning and involved in AI. I I feel like I have a a fairly good understanding of where they're at, what they're seeing, what the issues Mm. are. And there's all kinds of amazing stuff that all seems amazing right now, but is it very good? Is it going to be to the level? I mean, it's the same story they say, like if you see, you know, you see a bear riding a bicycle, that bears have ridden bicycles this is a true thing. They have some yeah. circuses where the bears rides a bicycle. It may not be riding it very well, but it, you're just so amazed that it's riding it at all. That, you know, it's not going to I think, I think that's a good comparison. And in my opinion, I mean, like, I'm not saying SAG should not have fought for every inch of making sure that they don't get replaced with AI. However, I feel like WGA was the one that had the more immediate threat because Chat GPT right now can do something that looks a little bit like writing. It's mm. not... It's not the quality of screenwriting that you expect from major uh, movies or TV shows. But, you know, what a showrunner friend of mine told me was that he wasn't concerned that AI would be a better writer than him. Uh, He was concerned that producers would say, instead of having a writing staff of eight, you're going to have a writing staff of two. Use chat GPT to generate infinite freaking yeah. uh, episodes of your show and then you and one or two other people can sift through them and then use that to help you write the scripts and then you rewrite the scripts and I feel like it's 
less about is ChatGPT going to be writing our scripts and more about our producers going to be cheap. And I feel like that, of course, is that that's what they do. They're cheap, you know, so it, they're I, incentivized I, to be cheap. So yeah. it's like it's not not really a surprise. You know, money that's left over goes into somebody's pocket. So, you know, the, yeah, the yeah. idea well, is to also try to like, make. All the, you know, it's weird with all the peak TV stuff, but still networks and everyone, the squeeze is on everyone to do stuff faster, to do stuff cheaper. And to me, that that concern about producers telling writers to use AI uh, was the most credible thing. And the flip of that, of course, to me is that I can guarantee you that everyone writing episodic television and probably a lot of people writing screenplays are going to be using ChatGPT to help themselves get through the scripts or whatever AI they want. And it's like, go for it. Who cares? Whatever helps you in your writing process helps you in your writing process. I think that a lot of times these tools are better for research than almost anything else. You know, like it's it's like Google plus like it can organize it for you and put it in a in a in a brief that that's easy to read. But in terms of, you know, with SAG, again, I feel like SAG needed to uh, they drew a, a line in the sand right now. as a they culture. Did. It's yeah. not just our industry, every industry. We have to yeah. figure out what we're going to do with AI and machine learning and kind of put guardrails around what it can be used for and what it can't be used for. But I don't think actors are in immediate uh I don't think immediately no. we're going to be replacing actors with no. AI or with scans of uh, them. Although, uh, it, and I would recommend that anyone listening to this, you can go online uh, and, and you can read all of the deal points of SAG's new deal. It's way too much for us to summarize here. Uh, but the AI stuff is kind of interesting and thrown into the AI is scanning people, which to me, that's actually not AI. That's visual effects, yeah, that's but different, sc yeah. scanning people and making them into like background extras and volumetric and, scans. Yeah. Yes. There's a lot of, there's a lot of technology that's going into that. I will tell you for the people out there playing at home who want to track when they should start really getting concerned. Uh, supermodels will, will go long before actors. Supermodels are going to be just generated in computers for a, a lot of things. That'll be really weird at Paris Fashion yeah. Week. It sh it certainly will. But uh, we're just going to be watching, you know, <laughs> watching <laughs> watching a, a computer, watching an iPad on a, on a r clothes rack, <laughs> moving up and down the aisles. It'll be fun. Uh, and the other one is, is you're going to want to look at animation. If you want to look at uh, what's going to hit first, you know, animated shorts, cartoons, feature feature I mean, length animation is going to happen long before the live action. Sentence. Months ago, we, we talked about uh, Corridor Crew kind of creating an anime using AI. But if you watch the video on how they did it, it's like it it wasn't like they just said, like, make an anime bleep blorp and it just spit it out for them. No, like no, they did a long way from that. They did an intense amount of work to to make it. And AI be, was kind of used to put the final look on it more than anything else. Well, I think we should uh, get to the interview with Bob Yeoman. Here we go. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. Last time we spoke, you said you always wanted to work on a film noir. Has that uh, has that changed? <laughs> uh, I haven't yet to work on a film noir, but yes, I would love to do a film noir. But yeah, I'm not done one yet. So, <laughs> I, okay. I would well, argue um, to live and die in LA is kind of a film noir. Not, yeah, no. you're right about that. I mean, uh, we recently screened it at the Academy, and I hadn't seen it for you know many many years. And you're right, there is a, a film noir kind of aspect to it. Ultimately, as you probably know, Robbie Mueller was the DP. I took over yeah. for Robbie, and so I can't really claim that as a you know my idea. I, I, when I got onto the film. It was just to try to, you know, keep what Robbie had set in motion and, and keep that consistent. But yeah, to some degree, you're right. It is a film noir. But yeah, I mean, I wish I had done more films like that. <laughs> <laughs> I Except for the car chase. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I recently rewatched To Live and Die in L.A. and I hadn't seen it in years. Yeah. And uh, that movie, I mean, like the kineticism of that movie is intense and that the car chases are like, I, I don't know that I've seen a car chase like that in any movie, including, you know, m much more modern movies that like Fast and Furious movies that build themselves on being about exciting car chases. Yeah. Well, Billy, I shot the car chase and, and yeah, yeah. Billy, Billy was, uh, you know, he, we watched a lot of car chases before we did that. And his goal was to make it the best car chase ever. 
You know, in all honesty, I think the French connection uh, with Gene Hackman and the whole cross cutting between the car underneath the tracks and the it's incredible on the subway train. I mean, it, to me, there's just there, because of the cross cutting of it. It just there's something about it that just feels so real, and you know, you feel like you're right there. And you know, Billy back when he made that film was, you know, there, there weren't a lot of the restrictions that we have today. <laughs> like blocking traffic. <laughs> yeah. And he, you know, you know, I love Billy, you know, he passed away recently. Yeah. yeah. It was very sad for me, but he, uh, you know, was not afraid to break the rules and push the envelope a little bit back then. And, uh, you know, I think that somehow showed up, in the film, you know, in a in an eventual film, when, when he 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 really pushed hard on a lot of stuff, and uh, that was just his his style. Back then, it was a little more wild west, you know, for lack of a better word. For know, sure. Description. Well, um, congratulations for Asteroid City, and also you've done uh, you know, it's I believe three short films based on Roald Dahl with uh, yes. with Wes Anderson. Yeah. Um, pretty amazing stuff. Did you now? Did you do all of these projects together all in a row, or uh, were they? Because like you know, Asteroid City was for Universal and or was released by Universal anyway, and then the the shorts were all for Netflix. Was it all around the same time, or how, how did it work? Yeah. Uh, well, we finished Asteroid City sometime late in October. I went over to England. We shot uh, the Raw Doll stories in England in uh, Maidstone. And there was a old TV studio there that had two separate stages that were not big stages, but medium stages. So the idea was we would shoot on one stage while the art department was building the other, you know, and yeah, then yeah. just flip flop back and forth. And the first one we did was Rat Catcher. We did uh, Henry Sugar and then Poison. And then at that point, they weren't, you know, they weren't under contract to do anymore, but Wes wanted to do more. So the dates for uh, the swan kept switching and switching and switching and going more and more and more. And we'd light the sets and shoot them. So there was a little breaks in between, but it was pretty much back to back for all those stories. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're pretty amazing. Like the choreography and the stagecraft of them, like just the art direction. But like it's the choreography. They're so complex how those are put together. How did you go about even, I know we were supposed to start talking about Asteroid City, but I'm just fascinated by the, the complexity of the choreography that you guys did, the dance between art department and camera and actor and blah, blah, blah. And how was that constructed? Did, did Wes Anderson come to you with like the full plan of it's going to be like this or was it something that was all worked out over a process? Uh, both. I mean, he, he made an animatic of everything, which he always does. An animatic is like a little cartoon of everything. Mm -hmm. and, and the art department takes that and creates that in a physical space. In this case, uh, it was a st soundstage. And there's a lot to work out on a lot of these things. You know, it's, and it's not like you just go and start building it. To give an example, because we would, you know, Wes is very specific about the compositions, the only way to really achieve those is on a track. You know, you can't just do a steady cam or a techno crane and get that level of, of precision, I don't think. And so we had a special track come from Paris that because of the size of the track, some of the sets, which had to slide open and closed, had to be built so that they were a little bit off the ground. So as we were dollying through the sets and they were opening up, you know, the track was underneath those sets. So, you know, for me, uh, it, because it was a big set, both of them, I, I typically put a lot of lights up in the ceiling because I knew that that was how we would just create an overall ambience. So that that took a week at least to put those all those lights up and you put them in a, a, a board so you could control the intensity of those lights and the color of those lights. Yeah. And uh, so it was a big electrical thing to do. And, and then the art department obviously had a ton of stuff to do and, and the props. I mean, the props were all very carefully researched and brought in. And um, so it was a combination of everybody. And there was a lot of R&D in the process, like the bandages thing that they put over Sir Ben Kingsley. You know, that was something that required several takes to get that right. 
you know, so they could put it on and off very quickly, but at the same time, allow him to see through the little slits. You know, I mean, there was a lot of R&D that went into all that stuff. And, and so, you know, everybody was kind of pushed to the limit as far as figuring this out and given the time period that we had. So. Well, I almost imagine, too, that you would have to have sort of a blocking rehearsal with the actors, almost like a stage play to get the blocking right. But then, you know, you're you're using these lights that are kind of, you know, precision and programmable. So was there a long rehearsal process to to even get to the part where you were ready to shoot that stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, the rehearsal wasn't really with the actors. We, we kind of build it. And Wes has a very clear idea of how he wants to block it. And so we just use people from the crew and we bring the camera and put it on a dolly and we work things out that way so that when the actors get there, you know, they, they've they seen the animatic. They know pretty much what the shots are. And, and there really isn't a lot of, in terms of blocking the actors, a lot of rehearsal. It's It's pretty well fixed. But, I mean, he might rehearse the actors just for them, he and the actors, to work out the scene, you know, performance-wise. But as far as blocking and everything, it's it, because everything is prepared so carefully, I think it's pretty much what we blocked out during the prep period. And then they have to find a way to somehow position themselves in the scene. And occasionally, you know, something comes out of a rehearsal where we change it a little bit. But it's all pretty worked out pretty heavily in prep for sure. Well, uh, let, let's jump in and, and talk about Asteroid City because it's uh, a remarkable looking film and I'm already seeing like uh, like in, in the YouTube universe of uh, filmmaker YouTube, people saying like, here's how to get the Asteroid City look. But ah. I what I really appreciated about Asteroid City, one of the things I really appreciate is it's kind of a movie about disconnected people and melancholy and you shot it in these like bright pastel colors like it, it feels like i mean it's it takes place in a bright place but uh, you know you could set a movie in the desert and still make it moody and dark but it's almost like the mood the atmosphere of the film is almost the opposite of what's going on in the in the characters lives can you talk about like when uh wes anderson first came to you with the script was it baked into the cake that it was going to look like that or is that something that came out of conversations that you guys had well certainly the the art direction and the colors of the sets uh, were something that kind of evolved. And typically during prep, we shoot a lot of tests with film of different colors to see how they're going to respond on film. So a lot of that is decided in Wes's head and Adam's and, you know, I'll chime in. And Milena, our costume designer, you know, but everything is kind of filtered through his hip through Wes because he's very careful about everything. And, uh, when I got there, you know, we started testing right away and shooting things right away. And if there were little things that needed to change, you know, they had time for the art department to repaint it or do other things. Uh, as far as the final look of the film, that kind of evolved a little bit. We, we shot film and in the DI, I think Wes, Wes was doing it in England and with a colorist he works with quite a bit. And I live in Los Angeles. So they started in this direction where they really popped the pastel colors and they gave the film more of a low con look mm -hmm. than our dailies. Our dailies looked a little more realistic than than the look they gave it. And they sent it to me in here in LA and, and I looked at it and I loved it. I thought, wow, this is great. I, you know, and so I said, yeah, let's keep going in that direction. So that was kind of the genesis of it. Well, Wes, one thing he said was he didn't want to use any lights in Asteroid City, movie lights. So there are no movie lights in the entire sequence. <laughs> and, Wait, what? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, back, back up on that. <laughs> uh, this is true. Uh, Asteroid City, you know, there were no movie lights. And uh, what did you use to light it? Well, this is what happened. Um, you know, for the interiors, when he told me that, like the diner, or the motel office, or the scene between Scarlett and Jason and their their respective little huts. I just said, okay, but can I put skylights in these? So Wes and Adam, you know, said, okay, no problem. So we put skylights, you know, any of those buildings that were the interiors, uh, the gas station was another one. And uh, then I covered them with very thick diffusion material. 
So it was very soft, even light everywhere. And it just kind of worked out that it was kind of the perfect exposure balance between the interior and the exterior, you know, and if you know anything about photography, the interior I exposed like one stop down and the exterior was like a stop and a half over. So it seemed very realistic. And, and, you know, it kind of goes back to the back in the days when they were shooting movies in early times with uh, in New Jersey, where they put the, you know, they would build their sets and just put a silk over it or something, you know, and, and, uh, so that's how we lit it all. And, and uh, you know, I, I think all directors, the less gear you have on a set, the happier they are. And as I've gotten older and my more experienced, I try to keep as much gear out of the set as I can. You know, it kind of, I think it not only does it restrict the actors a little bit in their movements, but also it kind of, I won't say destroys the illusion, but it, you know, if they walk on a set of a diner and you don't see any movie stuff except for a camera, you know, it just makes it a much cleaner experience, I think, for them and less intrusive. I mean, was that was that Wes Anderson's thinking about why to go that specific direction? Was it uh, was it about the actors or was it was like what was the rationale for no movie lights? Um, You know, I never really asked him (laughs) but i think it's it's you know his whole thing is is he you know there's a huge crew obviously but when we're shooting he has this kind of dream that he's making a student film so on set there's very few people you know it's like there's an army of people who prepare this but then when we're actually shooting, there's probably 10 people or less, you know, and really, you know, every, yeah, he, he's, is that, on, is that on all the films? Pretty much. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, it started really probably on Darjeeling limited because we were shooting on a moving train and the s- compartments were so small that there was no room for anybody. And oftentimes it was just the three actors, uh, myself, my focus puller, Dolly Grip, a boom guy and Wes, because there was no room for anybody else, you know? And as we're panning, they're down on the floor ducking and, <laughs> you know, and I, I think he really enjoyed the intimacy of that. And so there was a real kind of team spirit between all of us, you know, and, and, I think Wes really enjoyed that experience by having way less people on the set. So ever since then, that's been the rule. And a lot of it can be distracting people, you know, on other movies or on phones and things. And I've been on movies where there's like three or four video villages with an army of people. And we don't have any of that. You know, it's very uh, bare bones when we're shooting. And, And I think that was part of his reason. And also he was anxious to really delineate the two worlds, the black and white world, which was lit very theatrically with hard lights and the asteroid city world where it was all just natural light with practicals, you know, here and there, particularly on the dusk sequences, you know, we didn't use it, you know, typically I might have a, a big bounce or something that I put in or the use of silks. We don't use silks. Uh, Part of it was because, we were out in the desert and it was so windy that if you start flying giant silks, it gets really dangerous. His his hope was to use the sunlight as kind of a character in the movie. And, and like in Bad Day at Black Rock, you know, they were often shooting at high noon and it was very contrasty. And uh, it goes against the grain of what most cinematographers would would choose to do myself included so at first i was always oh okay let's shoot in the afternoon you know because it'll be back with he kind of would rather do it in the morning when it was front lit, you know and and so it, it took me a little while to kind of get on board with this approach you know like the scene where jason is telling the k- kids that is their mother had died it was very front lit you know and and another movie i might have put a giant silk over them but wes didn't want to do that so it was finding ways to deal with that contrast without using any lights which would be the typical without way. using any lights and without using silks yeah <laughs> without know. silks either yeah so you're I mostly mean, just using bounce right bounce and and in the interiors uh we did cover the skylights with a uh what we call full grid cloth. And that really softened it all out. 
and it, it just made a nice balance between the interior and the exterior. So it worked out. And, and so if the sun is hitting it, you know, it's obviously brighter, but say a cloud comes up, it is still, then the interior light falls, but the exterior light by the same amount. So it kind of is, you know, if you had lights in the interior and the sun, a cloud came across, you would have to put scrims in the lights, otherwise it looks lit, you know? And so this way it was actually a very effective way of working. And when a cloud came in, we just opened the aperture stop and, you know, it all worked out beautifully, you know, it was very quick and simple. And so in the end, I think it worked out really well. And, and uh, again, I think it made Wes happy that he didn't have to deal with people coming in, putting lights in where he wanted to shoot, you know, doing, you know, because you say start bringing lights and all of a sudden a whole group of people kind of descend on the set, you know, to bring the power, put the light up, put the scrims in. So, so did you simply have none of that crew? You didn't have uh, generator operators. You didn't have ga uh, ga gaffers. We, you, you, we, did you have lights on your truck at all? Uh, well, we started with them, but then we gradually got rid of them. <laughs> so we had a very small electric crew. And that, but of course, when we went to the interior of the uh, black and white sequences, we needed a lot of lighting. You know, it was very, we had a, a lighting designer come from, uh, he does theater in England. And so he and I kind of collaborated on the lighting for the black and white sequences. And uh, they light a whole different way than we do. And, you know, one of the big problems is we need a lot more light for film than they often do in theater. So somehow we had to meld our two ways of working together into one so that we got that theatrical look, but at the same time, it was film friendly. And uh, Wes is a director who always is pushing for a great amount of depth of field. He wants everything in focus, which requires a lot of light. So that was a, our challenge in that. And because it was black and white, we used a lot of harder lights, and that's something I've I've learned over the did, years. Now, did you I, shoot that with black and white film, or yeah, you it was did all black and white film, double just, X film? Oh wow, yeah. So that's was, is that reversal film? No, it's it's a negative. It's the only oh. negative they make, and it started on French Dispatch. We we started doing tests and prep, and and we would take go, take the camera out and shoot color, and then we'd shoot black and white. And almost every time when we would see the black and white image, we were like, oh, wow, that's really cool. So uh, I think Wes decided at French Dispatch to shoot a lot more of it in black and white than he originally intended. So that carried over to this. And, and uh, you know, we learned a lot about black and white. How, you know, you test different colors, for instance, a, a light blue shirt and a yellow shirt, you know, are so different on film, on color film, but then when you see them in black and white, they almost seem identical in a way, you know? And so you, you learn a lot. And that during French Dispatch, I shot a lot of tests with wardrobe and things just to see how different colors photographed. You know, that continued on with this film as well, you know? And, and so I, gotta was a, I was just going to say, I was going to jump in here because there's a real sense of theatricality that's going on with all this, the theater lighting and the blocking and everything that's, that's playing out on these scenes. I, I couldn't help though, but draw like a parallel when watching the Roald Dahl projects as well too, because it's so theatrical and yeah. th there's some of the same sort of like lighting cues you're talking about where suddenly then a light comes up and it's really just illuminating eyes and things like that. Uh, did Asteroid City then in, inform some of like, because you, you were handling all the lighting and now you're working with, I'm assuming stage lights and, you know, cinema lights again. Yeah. Uh, the lighting from uh, from this sort of sequence then bleed into the sort of theatricality and the the staging of the storytelling for the Roald Dahl shorts? Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, one movie that I always kind of look at beforehand is One from the Heart, the Francis Coppola mm. film. Mm -hmm. and, I could totally uh, see the influence of that. I, it didn't hadn't occurred to me, but yeah, that, that, that movie is definitely a precursor to the kind of style that you're you're playing with here. Yeah, and, and Wes and I both love that movie. And, uh, you know, I, we, we talk about it a lot, you know, because Wes, when he was younger, directed a lot of theater. And in all honesty, I'm surprised 
he hasn't directed more theater as an adult, but he, seems like he certain... directs theater in his movies. That's why. Yeah, he kind of does. Yeah. <laughs> Even going I back mean, to Rushmore, where he's got you know the platoon movie or whatever, you know. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. it was we call that one the Apocalypse Mile movie, but <laughs> yeah, and then there was also the Serpico movie in Rushmore. You That's know? right. And and so there's always been even in. Royal Tenenbaums, uh, Margot Tenenbaum has a little play, you know, yeah. that she does. And, you know, there's frequently kind of theatrical references to his films. And, and obviously in Asteroid City, it, there's a lot of theatrical references, you know. And, and uh, so it's something that's always fascinated him. And also kind of, I think that's how he stages things often for the, often for the camera. <laughs> It is comes from his love of theater and and you know that how precise that all is and, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think it affects not only how we lit it but also how we shoot it as well. You know, spotlights, you know, using spotlights to you know accentuate certain characters when they're giving speeches and things like that, uh, which most films don't really go that route. Lighting changes is something, but personally, I love the lighting changes, you know, and and. When we're doing the Roald Dahl things, even the shot of, of Rafe in the chair as Roald Dahl, you know, Wes liked to see the lighting changes in shot, you know, as, as he makes cuts, yeah. you know. So we set it up so when you're on the side, it was lit a certain way. And then when you're in the front, it was lit a certain way. And we fade the two. And he, you know, he said, oh, I like seeing the lighting changes. And I was like, OK, <laughs> so that actually ended up in the movie, which typically I mean, it wasn't my original intent to see him, but it kind of is cool. And it gives it a theatricality to it. I think that that wouldn't have been there otherwise. It would just been a cut, then a cut, you know, and uh, now you see the change after we make the cut, you know, and, and it, it gave it a little theatricality that i think yeah yeah it's drawing your attention to the theatricality of it as opposed to yeah. hiding it which is what makes it so fun and interesting to watch yeah there's a yeah. little bit of fourth wall breaking almost but it's not a like, lot of fourth I, wall breaking uh, okay. like uh, i keep thinking uh, about the actors who are like turning back to the scene and then turning back to the camera to explain stuff and you know well, like in, in the world doll stuff in, in particular but I'm, I'm talking about some of these more subtler lighting choices too it's like you, you know i think everyone becomes aware it feels just so theatrical it feels like you know you're you're, you're kind of having this live experience even though of course it's, it's not live and yeah and i think that's sort of the fun of it there's there's a bit of whimsy and you know i i think that most people don't think about uh roll doll necessarily well i mean they, they know him as a, a children's author but he he also wrote like a james bond movie he did all this other stuff so mm. i think it's it's fun to see these different sort of elements all kind of, kind of playing because these are clearly not exactly children's stories these are you know very you know general interest stuff for everybody and there's a little bit of weirdness which is all which i think is intensified by all of this which i think is so much fun okay let, let me ask that let me ask this question so you didn't get to use uh, all the creature comforts of uh, your know, electrical department on yeah. asteroid city um i have so many questions about this <laughs> now, and, I, and i didn't intend that we would go down necessarily this path but it's like did those in this situation did those limitations these you know self-imposed or you know, you know director imposed limitations then cause you and force you to become more creative with the way that you lit to get the sort of looks that you wanted did did you in, enjoy this limitation to talk a little bit about how that restriction then and you know influenced your look i i, I think that it influenced it strongly and in many ways it improved it you know and i mean for instance in the diner if if i didn't have that i probably would have put big lights outside and blasted big lights into the diner but this not only kind of took care of all the lighting that there was no time that we spent lighting anything. Whereas before, Oh, now, you know, we have to move it over here. Now I'll move it over here. And so it made the shooting process much more efficient. And but were you, were you chasing the sun a lot though? Like in the diner, you know, like at a certain point, the sun's just not going to be in the same place. So continuity won't match for coverage. Yeah, a little bit, but we, you know, it was scheduled such that, you know, we shot pretty quickly so that we didn't really need to chase the sun. So even, you know, scenes would be usually shot within a couple of hours and then something else was scheduled outside, you know, maybe we were doing the dusk scenes that night, you know, cause there was a fair amount of dust scenes that we had you know, we move quickly and I've always liked moving quickly, you know, on a movie set. I, even if I'm lighting it, I set it up. So when you go from a wide shot to a close up, 
it takes less than five minutes because the actors are in their in their space and they don't want to be sent to their trailer. Okay, now we're going to bring you back for your intense close up, you know, and, and I think directors get frustrated with that as well. And in today's world, particularly with digital cameras, I think there's less time to light and, you know, it becomes less of an issue. Whereas back in the old days, you know, you got your time and, you know, no one ever questioned it, but now people want to move quickly and uh, it allowed us to do that. And it was a nice soft light. Yes. I mean, maybe I could have put edges in or felt the sun, you know, in a different way, but that also is a time consideration. And in the end, I mean, you know, I'm very happy with the look of the film. And and as I said, we certainly got our lighting time on the black and white sequences because those often became very complicated with all the lights being on dimmers and things. And and so there was a lot to work out. It's like but, lighting designing a full play every time, yeah, every every, yeah, every setup. Yeah, it was. And Wes likes to work very quickly, like a lot of directors, and and so we had to be on our toes and make our adjustments very quickly. And and uh, but if you have lights, you know, at, up top, just covering so much. Oh, let's try that. Yeah, okay, that works. Yeah, okay, bring it up a little more. You know, so we were. Matt Daw was our lighting guy from England, and and Matt is very fast and very good. And you know, so the two of us would sit at the board and just you know control it, unless I was operating. You know, we, you know, we light it, and then I'd operate. You know, so I could be there with him. But he he did a great job, and he, he couldn't have had more two more different experiences, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm really curious also, you know, when you're talking about lighting without lighting, you know, you've got some amazing looking actors in this movie and, you know, actors want to look their best on film and everyone looks great on film. So I'm like, I'm wondering how you go about approaching the lighting of Scarlett Johansson or whoever, Jason Schwartzman, trying to make them look their best for the scene when it really just sounds like you're dealing with natural light and bounce and that's basically what you've got to work with right you know yeah. maybe, maybe some I mean, diffusion coming from did. top uh and we weren't we didn't put silks over their heads but like scarlet in that hut that she was at when she and jason are yeah. facing off i mean she was in shadow the whole time you know what now that i think about it i lied ah uh we did <laughs> In that sequence, we did between the two buildings. We did put a silk over it, so that <laughs> we did. So I lied. We, I, now that that's, I have it, that's but still not did. very much. <laughs> that's, that's that like was nothing. the only one. That was I, the only I one thought you were going to tell me that you that you you uh, had a camera uh, no, light or something. We had eighteen k, couple yeah. of eighteen k's, no, no couple lights, of grips. No <laughs> lights, but we did put a silk up on that one. And because oftentimes we were shooting during the middle of the part of the day where there would have been a lot of horrible shadows. Mm -hmm. And then we put a four by eight bounce card underneath. But, uh, you know, luckily, I mean, Scarlett's incredibly beautiful, obviously. And the hair, makeup, wardrobe people did a great job with her. And that's all she needed was, you know, a, a silk overhead and a bounce card underneath. So I can't think. The only other time we used a silk was in the observatory scene where it's tilda and grace you know with the telescopes and they're looking through the telescopes it was open at the top and we put a silk on the top of that so those were the only two silks let me think if i can think of any more i think that was the only ones we ever used you know so yeah i i have to i want to correct uh, myself I don't, we don't usually get to break news on on this show but the big news <laughs> is Two silks used in Asteroid City. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that right. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you also, like in this world where everyone's shooting movies on digital cameras and there's still a mystique to film, how much lifting in terms of making the image look as good as you want it to look is film able to do versus digital? Like if you had sw done everything the same, but you'd use an Alexa LF, how different would the movie look? Well, one thing I, I, I find is that film reacts to highlights much better. Uh, digital is great in low light situations, you know, and when I, I shoot, I've shot movies on Alexas. I shoot tons of commercials with Alexas. And I'm always amazed at how little light you need. You know, you can go into a restaurant and practically you put a little soft light on the main actor and that's all you have to do, you know, and Film always requires a little bit more finessing because of Asteroid City being out in the desert during the day. Most of the time, 
I think it was a good choice for film. I think I would a lot of the highlights would have been burned out on the digital mm. cameras, you know. Uh, as far as the black and white interiors go, yeah, we could have shot that, but I think it would have lacked the contrast and kind of the the grain. And certainly you can add a lot of contrast in post to a digital image and add green to it. But I don't know that you can totally get what that film, the film look. You know I mean, it, you could probably get it and 99% of the people in the audience don't really care. And they, you know, you could probably do that. You know, I remember I watched Nebraska and uh, when it came out, the uh, Alexander Payne movie. And I was in the Fantastic. theater yeah. and uh, I was like, wow, is this film? Oh, no, it's digital. Oh, is this film? No, it's but digital. That, that was shot on the monochrome. Uh, was it the... It, it was not. It was shot on the standard. And uh, Oh, Fabian, really? Yeah, they changed it to black and white, if I recall well, correctly. Yeah, and I, I asked Alexander Payne because he was there. And, and afterwards, I ran into him and he said, hey, you know, how'd you do that? You know, and he said they had shot tests beforehand. I think Faden Papa Michael was the DP. He is. And, yeah. and they, with, with the black and white stock, and then they shot digital and they went to the colorist and said, make it look like that. And it was one of the first times I was really, I wasn't sure, <laughs> you know, it was film or digital. So you can get close. But I, I think, too, Wes just enjoys shooting film and, and the process. And, and there's something different when you're on a film set and film is running through a camera as opposed to a digital camera where they turn the camera on and you know, whatever, you know, (laughs) I think he enjoys that process and knowing that there's one minute left in the mag, you know, okay, let's go hurry, 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 you know, and, and, you know, it's just a process that I think he enjoys more. And I do too. It's kind of old school. I was raised in film. So uh, I enjoy the process better, but nothing said, nothing bad about digital cameras. They're great, particularly in low light. If you're doing a lot of scenes on the streets at night, it's amazing what they can do. And I shoot the Alexa all the time. It's a great camera. But I just think it's it's a little bit different look, a little bit different way of working. And particularly in the desert during the day, there, you know, there's so many highlights in there that might have burned out. And that would have created problems in terms of shooting. We would have had to put more fill light in, I think, you know with 18 Ks through giant silks and things, which uh, was not something that was going to happen. So if we had shot digitally, there might've been a little more issues later in post, you know, and trying to fix this up, you know, a little bit, particularly the day exteriors. All right. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here uh, about the lighting, but you know, Asteroid City doesn't take place entirely with day exteriors. There's a lot of day exteriors. You have some like night exteriors with people outside sitting around. And I got to say to my eye, it was a very realistic situation. It very much felt like my eyes were this this twilight dusk sort of people sitting around having a conversation. Uh, Was there a sense of terror perhaps as the light is fading down <laughs> and you are like, you know, my lens only goes to two, to, only goes to one nine here. How, how, I mean, what yeah. is, what is going through your mind when it's like, Hey, are, when this, when it gets a little bit darker, we're just done. We're just completely done or cause you're not adding anything. You're not bringing no, in more light. You're, we okay. didn't add anything. Uh, well, uh, yeah, wow. certainly, uh, certainly I'm going through terror, uh, I don't know <laughs> any uh, but we found during Moonrise Kingdom, uh, if we shot 16 millimeter film there, and and if you remember the scenes where the girl was reading the story to the boy by the campfire, and it's kind of how we did those scenes. It, those were all at dusk, and we would start shooting while it was still pretty light out. You know, I mean, you know, it's still the sun had gone down, but it was not that magic moment. And then we would just keep shooting those scenes and, uh, you know, until oftentimes it went past what I thought was reasonable. And of course, you know, I would say, oh, we're done. We, we can't shoot anymore. But Wes likes to push the envelope every time. And and you can always take the earlier scenes and print them down a little bit, you know, if you have to, you know, something, not all of them, but there was always that one sweet spot where you could get two or three takes. And, uh, but when we got our dailies back, I was always amazed at some of the later takes that I had thought were unusable and they look great, you know? Uh, so I, and I also have confidence, you know, in Wes that he's not going to put some shot that's looks bad in his movie. He's, he's not going to do that. 
I'm, uh, I was just going to say, I was thinking about some of like the, think about some of the day interiors, like, you know, a lot of the sets have lots of windows and I'm thinking in particular, there's, there's one shot that's right from, from the back of this room and outside are these satellite dishes that are all spinning around at, out, yeah. out in the world. We see a lot of that space, like in my memory here, that's a, that's a big room. I remember the whole thing seeming like very, very lit. I mean, knowing this now, it's like a magic act. I have I know, no idea. I, I, I want to go I watch it I again right now. I, I feel like it, it, I mean, very, very soft light, of course, but I, I just can't even, I don't even know how you pulled it off. I don't know, I know. how like, shots like that get pulled, <laughs> well, get pulled off. I feel it's, the it's same. It's amazing. Well, yeah. Well, again, particularly because of the windows, when you put lights down low, you get into reflection problems, you know, and then you have to put flags up so that you don't see the light. And that was another situation where we had, a. a, a if you go back and look at the movie, there's this big kind of dome on the top and we put a skylight in there. And then the problem was reflecting the windows in the back behind us where, you know, we were. So we would have to put black across the whole back. Otherwise we were all reflected in the front windows. Yeah, of course. So between that and, and whenever you have a lot of windows, sometimes top light is the best just because for reflection issues. So it was a very soft top light from that uh, skylight that we had built in, which Adam built for us. And then giant black covering us behind us. So we weren't reflected in those windows. So that was how it was lit. And uh, luckily, there was enough light coming through the skylights and the window light that it worked out. You know, if it hadn't, <laughs> I would have been in big trouble. <laughs> but yeah, and again, you know, it was a situation like I described in the diner where I put the actors maybe a stop down and then the exteriors were maybe a stop and a half over. So it kind of split it. And, and, uh, and then when you do a DI, you can always play with the contrast a little bit. You know, you can bring up the shadows a little bit, bring the highlights down a little bit to try to make it feel a little more even out. And also we're dolling in and out and not seeing the camera reflected. And that's why we had the giant black curtain behind us so that we wouldn't be reflected. Otherwise you would have seen us all and seen the boom guy and everything reflected. So it was, yeah, it was kind of a, issue that, 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 that sounds like behind the scenes must have been quite the thing too because you're dollying that means that your black is probably also then floating too because like yeah. you're moving you well, gotta go to me oftentimes yeah. i'm on a dolly and i have a big piece of duvetine over me and the camera you know that uh, happens quite a bit with less where i'm just covered in black you know and i wear a lot of black stuff but then my hair is white so that always gets reflected so <laughs> uh, so we oh, just man. get a giant black cloth and drape it over me and the camera and then anything in the dolly has to have black tape on it so you don't see it you know that's that's pretty standard operating procedure for us for sure so um we we only have a few more minutes but i, I wanted to get into the uh i know we talked about it a little bit earlier but the shorts that you did for uh, the roll of doll shorts uh for netflix so when wes anderson gives you the script does he also then also show you the animatic that he's built or when you're approached to do a project with him do you kind of talk about it first at all yeah uh, first i get the script you know and mm -hmm. that's where it all starts and i so i familiarize myself with the script and oftentimes he's already cast the parts, which I find really useful for me uh, if I know what actors are playing those parts. You know, I go back and read the stories, the original stories, so that, uh, you know, I see what the original intent was. Then right away, he's sending me things, uh, you know, by Zoom or email, visual references. So because he lives in Paris, I live in L.A., we kind of have a lot of back and forth on the zooms and you know the art department adam will always send me these are the ideas for this, this is what we're planning for that so there's a dialogue that goes on even before i show up by the time i get there generally construction's already happened i mean it's starting to happen it's not like complete so every day i'll go over to the set with adam and wes and oh wouldn't it be great if this wall was a little higher or you know, what, what's going to go inside this garage? Do you have any practicals in there? That dialogue goes on for, you know, during the whole construction process. And we try to work out while they're constructing, we often put a track down and a camera and we rehearse some of our shots, you know. And, and again, when the actors show up, we have a pretty 
clear idea of what we're going to be doing. I mean, I went with other directors where once the actors are there, we rehearse and then we figure out how we're going to shoot it. You know, that happens quite that's, a bit. That's not uncommon at all. Yeah, because yeah, when the actors come in and the director works with them, the blocking changes, and then the director will often turn to me and say, so how do you want to shoot this? Or what's your idea? You know, and whereas with us, it couldn't be more different. You know, it's, it's, we already know how we're going to shoot it. It's just, how are we going to pull off some of these shots, which are quite honestly from the almost very beginning, Wes would describe what he wants to do. And I'm like, Oh my God. Yeah. They're that? like Rube Goldberg machines. Some of these shots, they're so complex. Like there is yeah. pieces flying in. I mean, it's yeah. just, yeah, it's, it's all kinds of stuff. There yeah. was one in uh, in Henry Sugar uh, early on, I think, where it's like the camera pulls back and then we're behind a fence or something, and I'm like, that yeah. had to have that had to have been flown in behind you, yes. or you had to have yes. had it on the camera the whole time until no, that moment. It's it's even like when uh, Benedict Cumberbatch comes into the library and finds the book. We had to pull back, and so that's the we, one I'm talking about. That's the exact yeah. shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so then what we had to do is we had uh, on two sides this is the bookshelves and they actually it came from one side so they slid in as we pull back you know as the camera starts pulling back these things slid in open and, and and they had to be there by the time we see them you know and so that was that was the bookshelf was just two levels there was a top shelf and then the one with the shelves underneath it so that that kind of stuff Actually, that was my idea. <laughs> that, uh, kind of stuff Take the has, credit. You should. Uh, That's a great you know, shot. It's so much fun. I always think of most of this stuff. Believe me, they, they think of most of it. But Well, like with most filmmakers, too, I would look at that and assume that visual effects were playing a big part in it. But because of, you know, what I know about Wes Anderson, I assume that it's almost all being done live practically. Like if Pretty VFX pu- play yeah. into it, it might be like, oh, we have to paint out a wire or something simple. Yes, that's pretty much it. Occasionally, there's a little paint out or something like that. But I mean, even from the very beginning, when Bottle Rocket in Rushmore, I mean, we, you know, Wes wanted to do in camera as much as possible. I think it gives it a little more of a homemade feel, and he likes that. And I think that when he started doing the animated films, uh, which I had no, nothing to do with those films, but uh, you know, it, it, and, and certainly the post production techniques in the last 25 years have changed so much so much you can do digitally and there are certain little things that they do in his films in even asteroid city but the mantra is to try to shoot as much in camera as possible you know and that's kind of how we do it well and it seems like the high wire act of of those roll doll shorts too is like you were saying about the lighting shift i want to see the stagecraft a, a director i know uh named gina powers hendry uh said she likes to see the brush strokes in the work and i feel like there's there's something to that like you can sense the brush strokes in in, in his work you know again like while i'm watching it i'm like yeah there's you you could just bring in benedict cumberbatch and shoot him against a green screen and put him into this world but there's something more magical about knowing that that's not at all how you did it yeah and and even that shot i described as he enters the uh library it's kind of a cooler light you know it's bluish and then it gets warm and then it goes as he starts to leave it gets cooler again and when he enters the gambling uh casino you know at that lobby there when he just enters that lobby, it's very blue. And then as the casino, as the, as the balls open up and he goes in the casinos, it's very warm. So we're constantly, again, going back to one from the heart, you know, we're constantly changing the color temperatures even while we're doing some of these shots. And uh, so it's, it's something that I, I, I've never really done much of before. I think part of that is due to the LED technology that we have now which makes it so simple to do these things you know i mean in the old days we'd have an electrician standing with a blue gel and he'd hold it up Oof. and then, and then yeah. and they, as the thing opens they bring the gel down you know and and uh so that was kind of how we did it in the old days so you need a guy on each light or you know whatever and now it's all been it's all done on a board so that you know uh and, and i often see know. it even on set where it's just being done on an ipad there's like some dude yes. on an ipad going bleep yes. blorp and just changing the color temperatures and fading and yeah. program programming it's, all it's that given stuff us such a more you know leeway and uh, ability to do things very simply which before would have been a big deal and now it's become much easier because of this te- new technology and lighting and uh, 
I've embraced it. You know, I think a lot of DPs have, and it's it's really been a game changer for us in a lot of ways. Hey, um, I, I know you said because of schedule that you, you didn't shoot uh, the Swan short for for this. Yeah. Um, but it feels very much in the same world. It doesn't feel like, you know, someone else stepped in. It feels all very much in, in line. Did you and uh, Roman Coppola have conversations about how how to set this up or or is it just, you know, he's he's so skilled that he was able to, you know, how, how did how did that relationship happen? I know you weren't you weren't part of yeah. that one, at least. But uh, yeah, well, I've known Roman a long time. I shot a movie for him called CQ. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I've done a lot of commercials and things with them, and we have a great relationship. And uh, one thing they did was they shot the swan outside, and they just waited for the overcast light, which in England, I guess, is pretty even. And we talked about lenses. We talked, to, you know, we had some conversations, and I just remember telling them, Roman, don't make it look too easy. <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, the thing about Roman, he's a kind of a master of all trades. He's an yeah. editor, he's a writer. He's, he, you know, in a lot of our movies, he's the uh, second unit director, camera operator. I mean, he oh, knows wow. how to read light. So, I, you know, I trust him implicitly, you know, and, and uh, we did have some conversations. And, uh, you know, I talked to him about lighting. I think they went and did a pickup of uh, Rafe as Roald Dahl, and uh, it was a close up. And I told him how he lit the thing. And, you know, and, and I sent lighting diagrams of how we had done that, some of those shots. And, uh, but most of the stuff was, if not all of it, was shot outside. And, uh, you know, they waited for the overcast light and that's how they did it. But yeah. It, so. it was, I think, this. It was either the. I think it was the second short that I watched after uh, Henry Sugarman, and there's a little sequence in it where Rupert Friend is lying on these train tracks. Yeah, it's sort of like this montage, and yeah. there's this really nice sort of like little moment that happens where the camera, you know, pivots from one direction to another, yes. and the whole time I'm watching it, I'm going. This is totally Bob Yeoman. This is totally yeah. Bob. It's like this is like it's like a thing myself. Like, this is so this is really, really great. And I, I keep thinking like it, it felt it felt almost like trademark. So I don't know. I feel like Roman Coppola like channeled you. He like, you know, he was definitely and I don't know if that was one of those sequences where like uh you know you guys talked about, but it it's it to me I was like it just it felt well, yeah. right out of your playbook to me. So I, they, they, I was it's it in the highest praise. I mean, I think that like no, you did did a good job with that. Yeah. Well, we also, uh, they had Sanjay our grip from India and Sanjay is a master at these types of things. And so, you know, between Roman and Wes and Sanjay, I'm sure they were fine, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, like I said, I, I've, I know Roman for a long time and he, he's, you know, he and I are on the same wavelength on a lot of things. So, uh, I thought that it, what they did turned out really well. And I, I take it as a, compliment that you thought I had come up with it, but I wasn't even there. I was shooting a movie in Boston. So, well, it all felt awesome. I liked it. So, right. um, I, I know that we are, are over our time with you. Uh, yeah. it was great having you back on the show. It was so much okay. fun talking to you last time. Last time it was just before the French dispatch. I hadn't even had a chance to see it. And, okay. uh, and you know, I'm, I'm really glad that we got to do this again. It was so but, much but fun. I had seen it. I just want to be clear. You, yes. Oh yes. <laughs> ben had seen it. That's why I didn't say very much. I was in the background. Like I hadn't seen this movie yet. So, uh, Bob, we gotta do this again. We, oh, we gotta have you, yeah. have, have you come back again in, in the future. This is so much fun. I really, really enjoyed our conversation yeah me too it was great so thank you guys all right so that was our interview uh for the second time with bob yeoman that was great thanks yeah. bob that was, that was so much fun yeah please uh, check out all his work his his work is just so amazing and one of the things and we, we talked about it briefly i don't know if ben cats cut it out or not but it was that he was sort of the re not the replacement but he filmed additional scenes for to live and die in la william friedkin's movie that robbie mueller uh, shot most of and he shot one of the most harrowing car chases i think in film history in that movie where the heroes are going up a curving on ramp onto a highway in the opposite direction of traffic. Just uh, holy yeah. crap! S and, such and amazing he, work, and and so modest too. And he's like, oh yeah, my you know favorite, favorite car. He had to he had to throw it back to uh, French Connection. He loved French Connection. I, yeah. I I agree though. French Connection that that car chase is insane. It's it's a really spectacular sequence. There's there's very few car chases that live up to French Connection. Yep. Uh, all right. So Ben, guess what? What? 
it is time to pay some bills. Uh, we got to th thank our fine friends over at Airy, Airy makers of uh, incredible technology for the motion picture and television industry. They make some of the best lenses in the world. And I, that is not not hyperbole. No, they, I mean, really incredible lenses. The signature series of lenses, the primes and the zooms are both absolutely fantastic. And they've got a new area on their website, actually, at uh, area.com, called the Creative Lens Showcase. And they actually, uh, I'm just going to read right off the website here. We're proud to showcase the work of cinematographers who have chosen airy lenses and filters to bring their creative ideas to life. And it basically has a bunch of different examples of, you know, incredible movies. You know, there's stuff up here from Dan Lauston and Emmanuel Lubinsky and uh, Ben Davis. Both Ben and Dan have been on the show. Uh, I've also floored Florian Hoffmeister has been on the show. You know, there's there's a few there's a few people uh, up here with the example as other work. There's also a clip from RRR, which you you know you remember. Er, we talked about that. Oh quite a bit. my God, such a great yeah. film. So, but uh, there is a place at the bottom if you've been shooting with their their lenses. I can't remember them ever doing this before. You can submit your work, and then maybe uh, your highlight, your commercial, your music video, your narrative, whatever it might be could be included in their lens showcase. So uh, I think that's pretty awesome that if people out there have been using their their primes and zooms, want to submit something for you know uh, promotion, really can't remember Ari ever doing something like that. They may have in the past, but it, it, if they did, I, it, I missed it. So if you're out there shooting something cool and you're really proud of your work and you want to send it to Ari, maybe it'll end up in a reel. Maybe it'll end up uh, for the world to see. So awesome. uh, go, go to Ari.com, click on the Creative Lens Showcase, and uh, you can check it out. And now, short ends. All right, Ben, it is our short end time of the show. Our short ends are our weekly obsession. It's what we're all about. It's what we're, we're into. What is your short end this week? Well, uh, it's a thing that unfortunately no one else can experience because it already happened too late. Um, <laughs> it's but, over. <laughs> so, uh, but, but you sort of can. So one of my best friends and friend of the show, Janelle Riley, she's an editor at Variety. But she also, uh, starting now-ish every year, she hosts Q&As with huge luminaries in the industry. And it's, it's for the Oscar push. So it's Oscars, hmm. screenings for the Oscar. And last night, she did a, a screening of a featurette that's going to be on the new Blu-ray of Oppenheimer. Uh -huh. uh, it's called The Story of Our Time, The Making of Oppenheimer. And then she hosted a Q&A with 10 of the department heads. So Emma Thomas, the producer, Ludwig Goransson, the composer, Ellen Moronik. Was, was Mar Hoyta there? No, he wasn't. If, if Hoyta von Hoytema was there, I was like going to pounce on him and make him come on the show. Um, uh, <laughs> did I tell you about the day I ran into him at LACMA? You did not. <laughs> it was just really funny. Well, so, well, let, let, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go, continue. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go, go on, go on. Anyway, yeah. I'll just, I'm not going to mispronounce everyone's name, but the editor, production designer, sound designer, hair and makeup people, VFX supervisor, special effects supervisor. So they showed us this like hour long making of featurette that's really well done and has tons of great interviews with cast and crew. And they, they kind of go through all of the creative on how the movie was made. So when the movie comes out on Blu-ray, uh, I think it's totally worth getting this on Blu-ray regardless. But uh, this featurette, if you're interested in general filmmaking, if 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 you're interested in like, what is it like to be the most detail-oriented filmmaker alive? Watch this featurette and you kind of, they kind of walk you through his process for how Christopher Nolan came up with the basic idea for the music and then how uh, Ludwig went off and, and kind of played with it and created the theme for the movie or you know how the movie was edited there's a great story the production designer has where they were going to film in the nixon library's oval office replica and mm -hmm. then they lo lost it five days before they had to shoot and they oh, only geez. had gary oldman for one day and they had to figure out how to have an oval office in five days and they got uh the oval office set from veep Sk Oh, I thought it was, I thought for sure you're going to say scandal, but yeah, it's no. like a veep, yeah, from veep, great. but it was uh -huh. like boxed up and not set up anywhere and in oh, pieces. Man. And in five days, they had to get it like picture ready for IMAX. So like IMAX, not known as the most forgiving format. <laughs> 
uh, that story. You know, <laughs> Clearly, they, said, they pulled it off. Clearly, yeah. They got well, they done. said that like yeah. they got they got it done, and Emma Thomas walked onto the set and she's like, "I I can still smell the paint." Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I, I have to say, uh, Janelle is a freaking rock star when it comes to doing these Q and A's, and I've seen her do these Q and A's, and you know, like you and I, I, we don't do anything like what Janelle does, but we interview we interview people who are you know giant luminaries in the cinematography world. Here's Janelle. Uh, don't sell yourself short. You've done some directors too. Uh, yeah. Okay. But check this out. Yeah. Uh, Janelle interviewing 10 people. Yeah. Gets all their on, names right, which live, I did. Live on can't, a stage. I, you know that she memorized it before she ever walked through that door. She knew everyone's. Like, she knew everyone's name. name. She yeah. knew exactly yeah. where they were sitting. Yeah. She she had uh, like one or two meaningful questions, meaningful questions for each yeah. one of them and kind of kept the Q&A going, had like real. She's a pro. And, she, and there's a reason she had her own show on, yeah. you know, the variety show. And that's you true. Know, she's a consummate professional. Also, both of our former boss once upon a time. So that's you know. true. We, we both did work for her at one point. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I would rec- I, I guess my short end should be the story of our time, the making of Oppenheimer, which I just thought was it. It made me want to go see the movie again. Uh, so maybe I'll pick it up on Blu-ray when it comes out. And definitely, it's one of those things that I love about being in L.A. is that you can go. This is at the Linwood Dunn Theater, which I'd never been yeah, to. Yeah. You, you, you were very familiar with it. But it's like a historic theater. Uh, Chris, by the way, Christopher Nolan came out. You can find clips of him on on uh, YouTube and Twitter and stuff. Uh, he came out and introduced it, but he wasn't in the Q&A. He was mm-hmm. hanging out after the Q&A talking. He was doing some press there afterwards. But uh, it, it was like all about the craftspeople who, who made the film. And again, I, I was bummed that Hoyte Van Hoytema wasn't there. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get him on the show, I hope. It would be great to have him on to talk about yeah. Oppenheimer. But if we do, if we ever get him on the show, you know, I'm just going to talk about Let the Right One In for 45 minutes. It's going to be like when we had Tom Siegel on and all I wanted to talk about was the usual suspects. It'll be that all over again. Yeah. I remember that. We got to get Tom Siegel on again because, man, we talked about usual suspects for a very long time. But, we, we, of- but, we, but we could do it again anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway, Ilya, what is your short end this week? All right. Look, I've been trying to really to stay away from anything tech, but okay. um, uh, I'm breaking that. And I think this is this is worth talking about because Canon has come out with a three thousand dollar lens and. $3,000 lens is in the sort of consumer world. It represents a, a pretty high-end lens. It's an expensive lens. Uh, but when I tell you what it does, when I tell right. you what it is, I think it's a total bargain. It's it's amazing. It is uh, in their new RF mount, which is basically where all their cameras are. Uh, but it's a 24 to 105, which is sort of like the holy grail, you know, focal range for zoom lenses. It's a 24 to 105 zoom lens. Typically, that lens exists, that lens is out there, and it's an f4. That is what that's what people are used to. If you want that kind of range, which basically is an all in one device, it's an all in one lens that gives you pretty much as wide as you possibly need to be, assuming that you're shooting in a, a full frame format, which a lot of people are very popular these days, and almost wide enough if you're shooting in a, a super 35. But that one lens, that all-in-one lens, there's people out there, they'll buy a camera and they'll get one lens. They'll get that one zoom lens, which will cover, you know, all their possible situations is what they think they're going to get this one lens and they'll do it. That's what this lens does, but it lets in twice as much light. So you can shoot in much, much darker situations. It's not a four, it's a two eight, which means way, way more light capacity also means uh, more out of focus areas. Yeah, shallower depth feet. of field. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's what I'm talking about. It also has declicked iris. It has a, cu- a cup, so it's it's very video film centric friendly. It is also still focus friendly. It, it but here here's what it does too. Or sorry, I should say still lens friendly. Uh, it doesn't telescope like a lot of lenses out there. Like they get much bigger if you zoom them. This one doesn't do that. It's all internal. It's got these internal motors and stabilization. And it's also got an external zoom control, which is kind of like also like a holy grail thing for people who are shooting like doc style. They want to be able to have like a tight wide, a T a TW uh, button control. There's an optional motor control that you put on the outside of this lens. And voila, it kind of turns into like an ENG style lens. So fast, full range. I've seen footage from it. It looks spectacular and it's three grand. If they make a cinema version of this lens, it's going to be probably a minimum of 30 grand, maybe even more than that. But for someone out there right now who wants a really incredible lens, and I, I, you know, every time we talk about technology, there's always someone out there who's like, oh yeah, this stuff is all so crazy expensive. 
three thousand dollars for what you're getting in this lens compared to everything I else mean, out in the is, market is, right is, now is insane. Is insane the motorized different. control part of the three thousand, or is that an extra thing? It's an optional. You'll have to you'll have to plunk down some more money if you if you want to get that as well too. And that is frankly another grand. That is more money. So it's not an inexpensive item. But if you can live without that, you can get into it for three thousand for twenty nine ninety nine. You can add that other thing on later. Uh, there's a it, they're not out yet. These lens this is, it's a pre order. Yeah, I, I hear it's going to be out in like you know, a month, basically like get it shipped before the end of the year. Uh, there's a pre-order over at Hot Red Cameras. I think we're charging 199 bucks or something like that. Someone can plunk down some money and they'll just be in line and immediately you can get it as soon as we receive them. But it's a pretty big deal in the zoom lens world. I don't talk about this sort of lens or this sort of thing very often. And, you know, it's worth mentioning and bringing up here because I think they're going to sell a boatload of these lenses. I think it's going to be kind of become the new standard for a lot of people. There are people out there who, you know, they made a big deal about an 18 to 35 lens uh, that came out a few years ago because it was really fast made by Sigma and that it was great. It is a great lens. I love that lens too, but that focal range just, just does not do enough for most people. This lens really will cover most people. It's a big lens. It's not a small lens, but at the same time, it's impressive. It's super impressive for what it well, does. Well, and I would point and, out that yeah. even though like dropping four grand on a lens and, and that controller, that, that might be a lot uh, for some people. But imagine like trying to get, I don't know if they still make the C500, but like a camera of that, that size, that's what you'd have to step up to in order to get that kind of functionality. You know, those cameras are more like 15 grand minimum, right? Exactly right. And you're you're usually talking about much, much bigger lenses. Canon does make a couple of uh, relatively inexpensive servo zoom lenses that are in a similar price point. And I, I got to say, I think it's kind of feels a little bit like eating their young. They're, this is going to take that. No one's going to buy the very slow older versions now that this new fast version is available. Well, maybe some people will. But this lens is really exciting. I expect that uh, you're going to see a lot of people using it, especially for doc work, especially for reality work, especially for, you know, YouTube creator content, because you can carry one lens around and cover your full range, which, yeah, I, I know I've spent a lot of words talking about this lens, but uh, it's worth checking out. If you want to know, want to know more information, go to hotredcameras.com. We'll put it in the show notes, too, over at Cam Noir. Excellent. Excellent. All right, Ilya. So that about wraps us up. You want to say who uh, who we need to thank? Oh, first off, let's thank Kay Zalatrachi. Kay's made the music that you heard in this uh, oh, episode. Oh, well, and, nope. and I, I, I think we should say, Kay's, I, I have it on good authority, he might be making some new music for the show. We might be having a little bit of <laughs> little little new music stuff going on pretty well, soon here. N- newsflash, I've been, I've been talking about this for, for months now, but I haven't heard anything, so I don't know if that's no, ever no. going to happen. I talked to him this week, and he said, uh-huh. hey, I'm going to probably have some stuff for you guys next week. What? And wow. so, Kay's, who was probably listening to this right now, you're on notice. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you're you're on notice, buddy. For yeah, uh, all, right, all right. So uh, so that's exciting. Glad to hear that. Uh, we got to thank Alana Cody, Alana, who has uh, been putting these episodes together, putting together our interviews. We got a bunch more. Really, some interesting uh, people coming up. I can't wait to uh, talk more about it. And last but definitely not least. Ben Katz. Ben Katz, our editor, who is making sure he is slicing and dicing and making sure that we uh, don't sound like idiots, that there aren't too many jump cuts. And he's putting together our uh, YouTube video, our audio file, and making sure that everything is uh, is hunky dory. And Ben, your job is going to get easier at some point here because we're going to have cameras where we can give you, you know, full video sides for both Ben and I. And boy, that'll be great because you'll be able to put together our show and you can cut back and forth and we won't have of all the sort of you know headaches and issues that we have to deal with webcams and stuff with phones, zoom right? yeah 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 exactly hey Elliot, uh where can people find you find me over at hot rod cameras hotrodcameras.com ben where can people find you you can find me at benrock.com you can find all my social media stuff over there and uh you know add me wherever wherever you add add people you i'm there probably except tiktok i haven't tried that one yet yeah no yeah yeah me neither no tiktok we're not going to ask anyone to smash any buttons. No, you, know, you, don't. You, you you could be kind and subscribe if you want to, but you know, I I still I, I smash feel, nothing. Feel, I, I, I I feel I, weird about begging people to do things like that. It just well, moreover, I feel like a, an uncool John Hughes dad being mm. my age and saying smash that like and subscribe. Yeah, let let, let, let other people talk. Pr- about press it, press it gingerly. You don't want to smash it too hard. You might give yourself an ingrown fingernail, or you might. 
you might hurt your your yeah, iPad there's screen. There's consequences for smashing too much. Yeah, right, don't smash. Sure. Like yeah. just touch it gingerly. Touch it. Ca caress it. Caress that <laughs> like button. All right, Ben, you want to take us out? Thanks for listening and watching. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.